Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Sarah Cardell, Dan Turnbull, for your uh, evidence this afternoon. We're now going to move to panel two, uh, where we'll be welcoming uh, Mr. Issa, who's the co-owner of ASDA, and Hayley Tatum, who's the Senior Vice President, Chief People and Corporate Affairs Officer at ASDA. Please come in. Hi, Ms. Tatum. Hi. Thank you. Please make yourself comfortable. There should be clean water cups there for you. Um, before we um, start this panel, I just need to declare my interest as a member of the GMB. Are there any other declarations of interest from colleagues? Um, I'm also a member of the Trade Union GMB. I'm a former member of the GMB. I'm a former member of the GMB. Okay. Shop at Asda. And Jane shops at Asda. <laughs> <laughs> I also do my monthly shop at Asda if we need to declare those interests. Um, I'm very grateful for your uh, services. Right. Um, so this session is a follow-up session to our previous um, hearing on food and fuel price uh, inflation. And as you know, and via the correspondence that we've published, um, we asked if you would come back and answer some of our questions, uh, predominantly as they relate to some discrepancy between what the Competition and Markets Authority have just told us in respect to fuel pricing, uh, but also some other things on the, on the record. And the whole purpose for that session was to understand if ASDA, but the other supermarkets too, uh, were doing everything they could to keep prices down um, and not unfairly profit during the cost of living crisis, which is something that ASDA said that it was working very hard to do. Um, one of the questions I wanted to ask Mr. Issa is, um, I saw from the accounts for ASDA, which I understand the company's called Bellis Finco PLC, not Asda, that's right, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it was loss-making. It was reported at making a loss of £62 million. Pounds. Why, why is Asda loss-making? Thank you very much, Chair. Before we get started, could I just say that I'm pleased to be with you today. I know this committee had several follow-up questions after the last session, and I'm looking forward to clearing those up today. The issues we're discussing are hugely important to your constituents, our customers and colleagues, and never more so than at a time when cost of living pressures are so significant. Uh, ASDA, we're very proud of the being a price leader, and so I'm happy to give you more detail on the business today. Thank you. Um, so to just answer my question, wh why, why was ASDA loss making to the tune of 62 million pounds? At, at sort of um, EBITDA level, it, it, it makes margin, but at, at sort of uh, net profit level, it actually makes a loss. And it was such a loss, I think you were able to claim £12 million uh, repayment from HMRC in tax credits. That's, that's right, isn't it? In my best recollection, it was about £2 million. That was uh, a deferred tax payment. And then subsequently, we paid circa £74 million in capital gains tax. Okay, fine. I just noted the difference between loss before profit, uh, before tax, sorry, and loss after tax from 74 to 62. So you had a bit of a tax credit, but there, there were some other things in there as well. Okay. Um, when I looked at the um, operating costs for ASDA, um, so the amount you're allowed to take away from the revenue you make before tax calculations, I saw that you had operating costs at ASDA of around £24 um, billion. Pounds. But when I looked at the breakdown of those operating costs, there seemed to be a gap of about 1.7 billion. Uh, have I missed something? Where is that 1.7 billion gone, do you think? I'm not privy to them details, unfortunately. You're not? OK. Um, let me try to explain a bit further. So Bellis Finco PLC, which is the company that owns Asda, is itself owned by uh, Bellis Acquisition Company PLC, Bellis Acquisition Company 2 Limited and Bellis Acquisition Company 3 Limited. Have I got that structure right? I mean, I'm not really into the detail of the actual structures, but it sounds right. Okay. 
Because when I looked at the accounts for Bellis acquisition company PLC, the ultimate owner of Asda, there seemed to be a dividend of £1.7 billion, which looked pretty much like the £1.7 billion I couldn't find in the operating costs in the Asda accounts. Is there any connection between the two? The £1.7 billion, I can't recollect what that relates to. Um, I do know there was a sale of some warehouse assets that totaled £1.7 billion. Okay. And Bellis Acquisition Company 2 Limited and Bellis Acquisition Company 3 Limited are both um, based in the low-tax jurisdiction of Jersey, which meant I couldn't get the accounts. Why would you base those companies in a low-tax jurisdiction? It's a structure that's um, sort of we do on acquisitions. And you put it in a low-tax jurisdiction for what reason? That's what our sort of advisors sort of um, recommend we do. Okay. Now, now, look, I'm not an accountant, Mr. Issa, uh, neither are you by the sounds of it, but when I looked at the accounts, it looked as if Asda was put into a loss-making position, was able to take money back from the taxpayer, paid out a dividend at the top of the company in a low-tax jurisdiction, and that seems to me that money's being taken out of the business whilst taking money back from the taxpayer and then not having as available income to reduce the cost of your petrol or your food prices or pay your wages properly to your staff. Do you agree with that assessment? I'm confirmed there's no dividends being taken out of us. Uh, well, at Bellis Acquisition Company level, there was. There was £1.7 billion noted um, as dividend. There's been no dividends taken out to, to shareholders. Okay. I think you might need to write to me, Mr. Issa, with just the, the detailed answers to those questions. Are you happy to, to do that for me? Okay, thank you. And I don't know if you heard the testimony from the Competition and Markets Authority before, but they were essentially not very happy with the way that you and your colleagues engaged with their inquiry into petrol prices and said that if they could have charged you more than £60,000 because of your behaviour, they would have done. Do you have any reflections on that? That's unfair, personally, because we we sort of complied with all regulatory sort of requests. You have nothing further to add. <coughs> yeah, can, I, yeah. can, I just, can I just say that I'm, I'm personally not very happy at all with the responses from um, Mr. Isa, who is the co-owner of ASNA. You've asked him some fairly simple questions. And unfortunately, uh, Mr. Isa says he's not in a position to answer. He's a co-owner of Asda. Yeah, I, mean, I, I do struggle, Mr. Isa, with the point that Ian Lavery is um, uh, making. I think you've been struggling to appoint a CEO and a chief financial officer as well. Why have you not been able to make those people appointed so they can come and answer our questions properly? We, we have appointed a uh, chief financial officer recently. Why are they not here? I was, I was asked to come as CEO. There was a discussion by my clerks whether the Chief Financial Officer could come, and in the end they didn't come. You, you don't know anything about that? Don't. Okay. Just to, just to build on that point, and then I'll move on because I'm conscious of time, the Competition and Markets Authority beforehand told us that one of the reasons they were cross with ASDA was because the people that you had sent to answer their questions couldn't answer their questions. But when you got involved, Mr Isa, you were able to provide the information they needed at the last minute. So it seems to me that when it came to the Competition and Markets Authority, you were able to find the answers and provide them when your staff weren't. But today you're telling me you can't answer any of the questions I've put to you. What's, what's the problem there? You've asked me accountancy questions and structuring questions, which I don't have the detail to. Okay. Well, I'll look forward to your written response and correspondence afterwards. Um, Anthony Magnol, please. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, just coming back to fuel, fuel pricing strategy and same question that Mr Brown asked the CMA. On the 27th of June, Mr Comerford told us that ASDA's fuel pricing strategy policy had not changed over, over many years. Is this an accurate statement? Absolutely. So... If any changes, uh, brother, if, what if any changes to ASDA's fuel pricing strategy have been implemented since you took over the supermarket in 2021? ASDA's pricing strategy has not changed. We remain the price leader in fuel. So, 
On fuel, the CMA found that Asda's position has been less consistent since the beginning of 2022. The CMA found that between January 2019 and December 2021, Asda was the cheapest supermarket for petrol in 89% in 89% of weeks during this period. In addition, Asda had the cheapest diesel prices in 94% over, uh, of the weeks over this time. But between January 2022 and May 2022, this declined to 76% for petrol and 70% for diesel. Why the change? The strategy did not change. and our, our strategy remains consistent. We are the price leader on fuel, and the CMA report confirmed that. I'm just asking in that decline between those two periods I've given you, what is the significant difference in those percentages? What's caused that? Market volatility, when you look at sort of fuel pricing, it's a very dynamic sort of space. There's lots of inputs in terms of FX movements, oil pricing, Hmm. sort of fuel pricing, logistics, terminal sort of uh, on cost refining margins, etc. So just to be clear, then, if you were to rank yourself against your competitors in the supermarket, excuse me, in the supermarket area, they would have a similar percentage decline as you have had in this period. I would say sort of for us, our strategy did not change and we remained the price leader. It was all external factors it would be different to other supermarkets, they wouldn't see the same level of decrease. Couldn't comment on the other supermarkets. I might jump back in if I may in a bit, Chair. Thank you. Alan Brown, please. Uh, Thanks, Chair. Um, Your your answers about no change of fuel strategy are completely at odds from the evidence we've heard of the competitions in market authority. So they say by remarkable coincidence after you took over, by remarkable coincidence as they decided to double its targeted profit margin in fuel, in 2022 and then decided to increase it further in 2023 and what CMA found was that the profit target margin uh, per litre of fuel is three times higher now than it was in 2019. So are their findings correct, yes or no? What I will say is during that period our strategy did not change in terms of fuel pricing. Margin is an output of strategy we sort of more than invested that margin into food where we where we sort of right. well, I said yes or no so is our findings correct as they deliberately decided to target higher margins per sale of fuel we we don't see this as a fuel business on its own it's not we see this uh, as a holistic dis- we see this as a holistic conscious decision to increase margins on fuel and trebling of the margin when, in how- 2023 compared to 2019 our margins went down from 2.7% to 1.7%. We took a profit cut of 24%, so we did not... Did you target an increased margin per litre sale of fuel? We don't see this as a holistic fuel business. We see this as a holistic yeah, business. I, I, I know, I, I know so, as his argument, so. it's one big business, but the whole point is, did you target increased margins on fuel? You can argue you're using it to subsidise some other part of the business. Did you target increased margins on fuel? Our, our strategy did not change. I controlled the pricing in ASDA, and that's what we did. Our strategy uh, right, was uh, the price leader. I'll, I'll, I'll go again, so it's a yes or no answer. Did ASDA deliberately target increased margins on fuel sales we per don't, litre? We, we, we don't see this as a f- fuel business, so you can't... You no, can't I know, but it's question. yes or no. Did, did ASDA plan to increase margins on fuel? At point we, of sale. We, we set our strategy and and then it's for the market to price where they Mr. price. Mr Iso, you are required to answer the question. If Mr Brown asked you whether you increased the profit margin on burgers, you would be able to answer the question, I'm sure. He is asking you, did you intentionally increase the margin on petrol? Yes or no? We, we set our strategy. The, mar- the margin is an output of our strategy. Well, I understand that. Yeah, but yes, just... yes or no? That, did you plan to increase the margin on sale of petrol? I mean, as I said, we don't see it as a holistic. We see it as a holistic business. But we only want the one-word answer: yes or no. 
It's not a one-word answer question, is it? Because it be, if it, it was a fuel business, I could answer that yes or no. Mr Iso, you just said to the committee, I quote, I control the prices. Yes. So yes. you just said you control the prices. Mr Brown I is control. asking you what your decision was in control of the prices of petrol. Did you put the margin up? It's a simple question. I, I set the strategy. The strategy was... You just told us you was. set the prices. Did you increase the price? We, we put the price on... Margin, the price that you charge, did you increase the margin? We set the strategy to be the price leader. I'm not asking you about the strategy, I'm asking you about the margin. Did Mar you increase the, the margin? The margin is the output of the strategy, sir. Well, I, I don't care whether it's an input or an output. I'm asking you on the question, did I, you increase the margin? I do not control the margin. I control the strategy as the input. Who controls the margin? The market. How? We set our price. You set the price. And what we're asking you is whether you intentionally set the price so that you would increase your margin. We set the price, that, and then others have an opportunity to undercut us. Alan, sorry, I've interrupted. Yeah, I still didn't get that, yes or no. So I feel we may need to give up, yeah. unfortunately. So, okay, yeah. so again, the evidence. So, 27th of June, the committee asked Mr. Comerford if the CMA's findings from May that at least one supermarket had significantly increased its internal forward-looking margin, if that applied to ASDA. Now, at the time, would Mr Comerford have been aware of the plans internally within ASDA to increase the margins on fuel? The strategy remains unchanged. Would they have been aware of the strategy in terms of increased margins? The strategy was to be the price leader and remains the strategy, and that's unchanged. Earlier on, I, I questioned the CMA, because um, the CMA found that as they were feathering prices and using the volatility of fuel price associated with the Ukraine war as a way to slow down price reductions when uh, wholesale fuel prices were dropping. I, I put it to the CMA that as they were gouging their customers in doing so, the, upper, the CMA said it wasn't gouging, but ASDA saw it as an opportunity. So did ASDA see it as an opportunity to create increased margins on the back of the volatility associated with the Ukraine war? Absolutely not. No. So is the CMA wrong? ASDA weren't feathering and slowing down pricing? We, we buy fuel on a three-week lag with vari variable inputs along the way, and where we can, we pass on the decreases to customers. CMA said this particularly applied to diesel. Now, it, is it a remarkable coincidence that at my local ASDA, following the CMA report, the diesel suddenly dropped in price below unleaded petrol? It's the first time that's happened in a very long time. So that just coincidental when the CMA published its report? We, we pass on decreases as, as quickly as we can to customers. Did diesel prices fall quicker after the CMA published the report saying that as they've been feathering and taking opportunities where there was less competition? Absolutely in line with strategy. So it was just coincidence diesel started falling again and as Can I just check Mr Isaac, when you say strategy, could you help me understand, what is it that you mean by strategy? Our strategy is to be the price leader on fuel. And that means to be cheaper than everyone else? That's the strategy. Yeah. And so you then presumably make a decision about how much cheaper you want to be compared to everybody else as part of that strategy. We, we set our pricing on the strategy that we have in terms of the information the market is at. We, we put the price at, at whatever the price is. Now, the competition have the ability to react to that, in which case we would react to that again. OK, because I understand... Um, that when Walmart owned Asda, they had the same strategy. They wanted to be a price leader, cheaper than every other supermarket. And they set the strategy at being one pence per litre cheaper than their competitors. That's how they delivered the strategy. My understanding from a whistleblower is that since you've bought Asda, Mr. I, so you've changed that from one pence cheaper per litre compared to competitors to 0 0.1 pence per litre compared to competitors. Is that right? Strategy remains unchanged. Answer my question. When Walmart owned Asda, it set the price at one pence cheaper per litre compared to competitors. When you bought Asda, Mr. Isa, did you change that 
No, the strategy remains Did you change that number from one pence per litre cheaper than supermarkets to a lower price? The strategy remains unchanged. Can you, I'm going to ask you one last time and remind you that you're required to answer my question honestly in this setting. Did you change it from under Walmart from one pence cheaper per litre compared to competitors to 0 0.1 pence per litre cheaper than competitors? No, I did not. No, you did not. OK. Thank you very much. Anthony Magnol, please. I think, did you want to come in, Jane? Oh, sorry. Jane's yeah. got the next no, no, question. No, no, beg your pardon. Sorry. I, I, I just want to come on to this point, which is that you're not answering the point around internal margins, but what, how do you explain the CMA's point about fuel prices across Asda estates being more varied than ever before? So across all your sites where you're producing fuel, the fuel price itself is very varied. How does that work within your strategy? Sort of how pricing works is uh, sort of the which terminal price um, sort of um, the fuels pulled out of the logistics costs, the service cost of that particular site, etc. So there is always variation and fluctuation around sort of pricing by site. So just to be clear, there's no strategy or no sort of view that you have to increase prices or keep prices at a higher level. Um, in more affluent areas and reduce them in other areas or vice versa? You haven't done that. It's no. right. strategy is to be the price leader. Right. OK. Thank you very much. Jane Hunt, please. Thank you very much. Just to follow on from that, uh, Mr. Isaac, you said a moment ago, where we can, we pass the decreases on to customers. Mm. Where can't you pass on those decreases? And what, under what circumstances do you decide, no, I'm not going to pass on that decrease which we've received? We do so regularly, so wherever we can, we will do. No, but you said where we can, which implies sometimes you can't or sometimes you don't. What, what circumstances mean that you would not pass, pass on that decrease? We, we always do pass on decrease. You said where we can earlier on, is well, that incorrect? Yeah, I would say we, we always do pass on decreases. We're talking about petrol now. So, um, for example, when um, the government dropped the price per litre by five pence, you did that immediately, did you? Immediately, yes. OK, thank you. So, on to my question, if that's OK. On the 27th of June, Mr Comerford told us that ASDA had fully engaged with the CMA on everything, that ASDA had, that had those conversations and the CMA had all the documentation. Mr Comerford didn't tell us that ASDA had been fined £60,000 for failing to comply with two notices issued by the CMA in relation to its market study. Why did Mr Comerford not inform us and what happened there? The CMA asked a specific question around data that we sort of didn't have in the business. Our systems are actually out of Walmart in the US and and we sort of asked them sort of repeatedly around getting this information and hence why that information wasn't available. available okay, I, un I understand that happened. Yeah. I asked the CMA about that earlier on. But you'd been fined £60,000 because you'd not provided information and yet Mr Comerford told this committee that ASDA had provided all the information. Why was that? ASDA has provided all the information that, that it has to, to the CMA. It hadn't provided all the information that the CMA had requested. My understanding was, I think it was said, they said three questions were not responded to at all. It, it, to was, it was one particular question that, that was answered and was answered correctly. Myself and Mr Comerford went, went to a subsequent CMA meeting and confirmed that the question was answered correctly. So why did Mr Comerford tell us that everything had been answered when it had not? It had been answered. Okay, I'll give up on that point. Um, do you now track all the information that the CMA requested? So should they ask you in the future, you'd be able to provide it? The historic information that they asked for does not exist in the systems that we have today. However, do you now have it? Oh, I'm sorry. However, we are in the process of upgrading all our systems. So once the system implementation is completed, we will have that information. OK. And when you were um, asked for an interview, the, uh, you sent somebody along, first of all, that wasn't equipped with the information, even though they'd been given the agenda and the questions that were going to be asked, and therefore they weren't able to answer them. Uh, and yet, um, later on, two more senior leaders came and were able to answer on that occasion. Why didn't you send the two more senior leaders the first time around? 
given the conversation we had with the CMA at the time and the agenda items, if you give me the same conversation and the same agenda items, I would send the same individual. Right, okay. So you sent somebody along who wasn't able to answer the questions you already knew, but you do it again? No, he did answer the questions. It was one particular question that myself and Mr Comerford went over seven days after that meeting and answered the question, and it was the same answer that um, the Vice President gave. Okay, thank you. There seems to be a bit of a recurring problem where the CMA feels like you're not answering their questions, and uh, I think I can probably say on behalf of the committee, we probably feel like you're not answering our questions. Why do you think that problem exists? What's the problem here? We comply with the CMA. This, and if I knew. I mean, we fined 67 Polo and we My colleagues are, are muttering, but saying that you were fined for not complying. So by its very nature, you did not comply. Um, and you're not also answering I mean, our questions the, for the, you today. The, in, the information request that they ask for simply does not exist in our business today. And we did not know that at the time. That's why we chased Walmart up for them for that information. The IT systems are based in, in the US from legacy systems. OK, well, that's a legitimate point. So thank you for making it. Um, Jonathan Gullis. Thank you, Chair. And Mr. Issa, apologies for my delay. I was in the chamber presenting a petition on behalf of my constituents, which is why I've come in late. Uh, Ms. Hunt has made the points I was making perfectly. When, much to my annoyance, I did ask a question. It was, I think, question 24 of the session where we had the supermarkets, including Mr. Comerfield from ASDA about the idea of the obviously future targeted margin in 2023 being three times higher than it was in 2019. We asked if that was one particular supermarket. We were told on that occasion, you know, I put it, was, as to, was that, as to that one, we were told no, from what I remember of the minutes. It is now described that that is actually the case. Why were we told the wrong information? Because parliamentarians asked that question in good faith and were given false information. All I can say is I'm here to answer your question, sir. With due respect, I can talk about my track record of the ownership that we've had. Our strategy has not changed. If you look at our key investments that we've made, we've made £40 million in dropped and locked. We've put £2 million in Kids Eat for a pound. We've invested £70 million in Just Essentials. We've invested £200 million back to customers in the cash spots in, in, in our rewar rewards. Issa, apologies. These are lovely statistics for you guys. We're talking about fuel specifically. The 5p cut was introduced. The freeze on uh, increase in fuel as well from inflation. The CMA themselves have said that Asda and Morrisons were forecasting profit margins. That led to Sainsbury's and Tesco's following suit which meant that people were being ripped off at the pump when there are other places like Northern Ireland where effective pump watch style scheme is in place that were at some points 10.10p per litre cheaper than it was in England. So you can imagine the real anger that constituents are feeling in a time of cost of living when they're already having to face a squeeze at the till from the supermarkets, which of course the supermarkets themselves, I accept, have also had to face, but to then be hit with a double whammy at the pump despite government intervention to the tunes of billions of pounds of taxpayers' money, they have not felt the reward. And it is only until the CNA, named and shamed essentially, that suddenly supermarkets magically managed to find a way of say, taking 6p off per litre off their costs. Why is it that it took the CMA to name and shame for ASDA to take action? What I can say is our strategy remained unchanged. The margin we, we made out of that, we more than invested that back into food and I can only say that from a profit perspective, our, our profit margin went from 2.7% down to 1.7%. Do you drive a gas guzzling car, Mr. Issa? A fuel driving car? Nice car? Range Rover? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Diesel? No. no. So, put, so is it electric or is it a petrol? Petrol, okay. So when you're filling up at the pump, Obviously, you're a wealthy individual. Congratulations to you. I don't bemoan people making money. But when I represent a constituency where the average earning is £100 less per week than other parts of the country, and they are seeking to fill up their car, and they are finding out that because the Competition and Market Authority 
names and shames you and others, but Asda and Morrisons were leaders in this, and then suddenly overnight a 6p drop, which is more than the government's 5p cut, took place. Do you understand why customers think you've been taking them for a ride? I do understand where these customers are coming from. From, I grew up in that same environment these customers are facing. I are, I'm absolutely in touch with these customers. That's why I chose to deliver incremental pay awards. I invested 200 million in, in cash pots back to these customers in, in where they need it most and, and pay as well as dropped and locked and lowering the prices of food. So absolutely, I do understand the plight. I have been there. I grew up in a two up, two down house uh, and I go there every week with, to visit my family and friends and my mum lives in that same neighbourhood still. So I do understand the plight of these customers. My final comment, Chair, before I defer, is just simply to say that I think people will swallow that quite bitterly because whilst I accept, Mr Easter, that you come from a background where obviously you can empathise and understand the people I represent as well as all of us on this committee, when they see the private jets, when they see the gas guzzling cars, when they see the money, however, not being passed on, those savings to consumers at the pump, they're rightly going to be angry and I was very angry to be misled in the committee. I think we'll have to leave that as a comment, not a question. Charlotte Nichols has got a very quick supplementary and then we must move on. Mr Easter, you keep saying that the strategy has not changed and yet when we had the CMA here earlier they were very clear that there has been a significant change in your strategy. How can you keep saying this in your answers to people over and over and over again something that we have been told by the CMA is not true? I can confirm our strategy has not changed. The CMA report confirms we are the price leader on fuel and where we enter a market that whole market of the price of fuel comes down on the back of us that entering that market. When they said there have been two significant changes to your Absolutely. pricing strategy, you're saying that the CMA have misled this committee in making that statement? I can tell you that our strategy has not changed on fuel pricing. Um, I must bring another colleague, but if there's time at the end, Jane, I'll okay, bring you back you. in at the end. Um, Ian Lavery, please. Uh, thanks. Uh, th there's obvious concerns about the... Um, the merger between ASDA and, and AG, and we discussed that earlier in, the, in panel one. Uh, and the, the, the GMB union has warned that with the rise in interest rates, ASDA's debt could become unsustainable after the deal with AG goes through. I'm just wondering whether the acquisition of AG's UK and Ireland businesses could negatively affect ASDA's financial sustainability. The EG acquisition is a strategic acquisition. It gives us sort of uh, access to the convenience market, and, which is 40 billion, the fastest growing of the food sector. And it also gives us access to the 60 billion food and beverage market, which is growing at double digit. It also gives us the ability to deliver a differentiated model than the other big four grocers having food service and able to deliver multiple missions in one convenient destination. Do you think it'll, it'll positively affect ASDA's financial uh, sustainability, not negatively impact? Yeah, strategically, it, it's a strategic acquisition and it will enhance ASDA's proposition. Very interesting. ASDA plans to fund the deal in part by a £1.1 billion pounds of property-related transactions which includes selling and leasing back some of ASDA's supermarkets. I'm wondering whether, is that accurate? Uh, and if it is accurate, uh, how many of your stores will this potentially apply to? I mean, if you look at the context of the deal, that's correct, 1.1 billion will, will be financed. However, there is 1.2 billion of incremental freehold assets coming into the deal. So net, ASDA will be in an enhanced position Right, it might be in an enhanced position, but I'm just wondering how many stores that uh, ASDA might sell, supermarket stores might sell, and lease back as a, a result of that, as a result of the merger. There is some stores that will be sale and lease back, and there will be some that will go on a ground rent basis. So, any idea of figures? Tens. Tens of what? Tens. So about fifty, sixty. If you, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not being rude, but I don't know what you mean by tens or fifties. 
50 or 60 stores, between 50 to 60 stores. Between 50 and 60 stores will be sold and leased back? I think, I think there's, there's 25 stores that will get leased, sale and lease back. And there will be an element of, I'm, I'm not sure the exact number, but there will be about 50 stores that will have a ground rent um, attached to it. Agreement. The Financial Times estimated that as that took on £3.7 billion of what they class as junk rated debt as part of your buyout of the company in 2021. How will your acquisition of AG's UK and Ireland businesses affect the amount of debt on ASDA's balance sheet? ASDA is a highly cash generative business and when we look at sort of the cash that it generates and, and the, the sort of debt payments that it's got, then it's more than manageable. You haven't got any concerns whatsoever with regard to that? None whatsoever. Because lots of other people obviously have, and, and you'll have seen that in the press, but in, in your position you've got no, no difficulties. And w with regard to the um, the plant, the AG Group, they plan to use the uh, proceeds of the deal to repay some of its debts. Will ASDA need to come to the AG Group's rescue later down the line if indeed it struggles to, remain, uh, to pay its remaining debts? This is a strategic acquisition from ASDA in to buy the EG convenience business, there is no plan on anything else between ASDA and EG. So you don't think you'll need to come yeah. and bail the AG company, AG no, no. group out at all? Yeah. No. And it's, it's being reported, I think it was Sky News, that uh, your brother and TDR Capital are planning to use ASDA as a cash cow to pay off your debts. How would you respond to that? Speculation. <laughs> it's, it's speculation, but how would you respond to that? I mean, it's, that, that's not really a good enough answer. Is, is, is there any truth in the matter? Or, uh, uh, can uh, you see it happening? No, um, uh, as, as is it on the cards? No, ASDA is its own entity. It's got its own board, and it, it, it has a purpose to serve customers, and that's what it's focused on. Why would people suggest this and that, that you know, your brother and, and others are planning to use the ASDA um, purchase acquisition as a, as a cash cow to pay for your debts? Why, why would people say that if, it, if, if, if it's just not true or...? Couldn't comment on that. You couldn't so. comment, all right. And can you confirm that uh, how much debt does the, the AG group currently has and when this debt needs to be repaid how far has the acquisition of the AG UK and Ireland business contribute to paying off these debts? So, there's like three separate questions here. I, I can't, I don't know what AG's uh, exact debt is today. No. So, you, you, you haven't got any idea about how much debt uh, the AG group currently has, even though you've just merged or you're in the process of merging? You haven't got any it's idea. It's not a merger. ASDA is acquiring EG's convenience and food service business. But you haven't got any idea in your position um, what debt it has, when it needs to be repaired, and uh, how far ASDA's acquisition um, is, is paying off and ready to contribute to paying off these debts. You haven't got any idea with regard yeah, to it? Uh, to represent ASDA, and I, I genuinely do not know what... Well, you what... surely, surely simple... Financial due diligence would sure uh, would give the answer to these very simple questions. If you are merging with a company and the debt, merging, you would, it's you, an, it's you would ask in your position how much do they actually, how much are they in debt? When will they have to pay it back? How will they pay it before you actually join with them, merge with them? I mean, it's these not. are simple. These are very very simple, straightforward questions, Mr. Isa. It's not a merger, sir. We, ASDA is acquiring, it's not a merger. ASDA is acquiring EG's convenience and food service business for £2.27 billion. Pounds. That's what ASDA is. And you don't class this as a merger? It's not a merger, it's an acquisition. It's an ASDA acquisition. Well, under an acquisition, would you not normally ask these questions before you acquired before you acquired a company? If I wanted to buy something, I thought that's, that whatever I was buying, the, the company... Like had a huge 
burden of debt. I would want to know, like, how much? And I want to know how and when it could be paid back and how it might affect the company which we've just acquired. I mean, are you, are you honestly saying you haven't got any idea? I, I am here to represent ASDA. ASDA is doing oh, an acquisition. Oh, no, we are here ASDA to represent, doing, but you're not doing a very good job, I'm afraid. ASDA afraid. is acquiring the EG convenience and food service business for £2.27 billion. How they choose to spend that money, I don't know. I'll give up. Thank you uh, very much. We're now going to Andy McDonald, please. Thank you, Chair. Good uh, afternoon, Mr. Issa. Uh, can I turn your attention to the people who work for you uh, and who help you be successful? And can I just remind you, on the 28th of June, Mr. Comerford wrote to us to clarify that ASDA's last resort position, as he described it, if ASDA can't reach an agreement, it may seek to dismiss and re-engage colleagues on new terms and conditions. Is that correct? This is a live consultation and I can... No, 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 I didn't ask you that. that I'm asking you about Mr Cla Comerford writing to us and he gave us that clarification that the dismissing or re-engaging any ASDA employee on new terms and conditions um, uh, it will only apply in the, as a last resort. Is that the position, yes or no? Our position is to get to an amicable agreement with, with our negotiation. So is what was colloquially known as fire and rehire, part, is that a last resort for you as an option? Our, our mission and our team is tasked to reach an amicable solution, and maybe Miss Tatum can give you uh, an insight into where we are with that. Well, we perhaps Miss Tatum can answer. Is have you communicated that dismissal and re-engagement is an option as a last resort? Yes or no? We have communicated with our colleagues that we plan to um, reconsider the current 60, 60 pence an hour premium that a small group of our colleagues currently receive. We went into consultation with those colleagues in February of this year. At the same time, we explained future pay rises and um, across this year that we plan to make that would exceed the premium payments that these colleagues um, currently receive. So well, I, well, I'm not, I wasn't asking you to get into the, the dispute. I was asking you whether dismissal and re-engagement on different terms is there as part of the strategy that Mr. Isaac, he likes the word strategy. Is that part of the option available to you as a company? And all have you communicated that to people? All options that are available to us legally, we open those, the consultation by explaining all options to our colleagues so they are fully understanding the track with the transparency so is no no i'm not going to let you let you talk this out uh, because that's that's i'm afraid that's a tactic that's been deployed i'm simply asking you straightforwardly have you is that part of your armory to dismiss people and re-engage them on less favorable terms and i'm trying to get a yes or a no from either mr isa or from you yes or no I'm not playing any tactics with you. Just I'm tell me yes or no. We are working through this with our GMB partners, who some will be in this room today, and they can clarify. Well, you see, we that's the point. Meeting. You see, it is, in, it is in the current consultation document, is it not? All options are in the consultation document. Is that option in... in not all options... Am I, it's like drawing teeth talking to this company. Why will you not answer a very straightforward question, and then we can make progress? And, I'm happy to make progress. As a last resort, as we get through our consultations with our colleagues, we will determine what action is the right outcome. We have not made any decision at all. This is a live consultation, as Mr Issa and Mr Comerford said. Last meeting was last week. The next one is still this week, still ahead of us on Friday. 
So we can't confirm what we will or won't do. Because I'm we not asking don't. you to do that, but you know the point is that you've set off on this journey, uh, saying that this is available to you as a last resort, and I, and, and I cannot get from you an admission that that has been your your position. You've not set not not made that clear to this committee, and it's very very frustrating. I'm sorry if I'm coming across this. Well, you see, I you were were you part of the contract six consultation? Was. Yeah, that was in 2019. 2019. Uh, Asda used fire and rehire there, didn't they? What we did in 2019... Did you use fire and rehire? We entered into consultation with 118,000 colleagues at the end... Did you use fire and I'm rehire? I'm just going to answer your question, sir. At the end of the consultation process, which we took many months across 2019, in November 2019, we lost 205 colleagues as a result of that consultation through that process of dismiss yeah, and re-engage. You fire did. You did fire, you, so you did engage in fire and rehire. Thank you for that. Have there been, Mr Esau, I'll return to you, have there been any internal discussions either within TDR, TDR or ASDA at a board or senior management level regarding future plans that may involve the use of fire and rehire? No. That hasn't happened? No. Are you aware of any discussions taking place regarding future workforce strategy that would include fire and rehire as part of the consultation process? No. So you're not doing that? Have ASDA got any plans for any significant restructuring amongst the workforce? I mean, we are in a dynamic business today. Our costs are, are sort of ever under scrutiny. We have to be competitive. As we said, we have significantly invested in, in, in no, 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 that customer wasn't what I was proposition. Asking you, I can understand we, the we, rationale behind that, Mr. Ice, but I'm just asking you, I, if you if there are any plans for any significant restructuring amongst the workforce. As any company of our scale and size would do, we are constantly evaluating our options around operating model for sure. And we, we got a response from Mr Comerford on the last occasion that he'd go away, because I asked him, is ASDA going to recognise the GMB as a, 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 a trade union for negotiation purposes? Uh, and he said he would take that away once to cooperate. I was asking about recognition specifically. How far have you got with that? Are they a recognised trade union? They are a recognised trade union in our business. They currently have a collective bargaining arrangement on pay in our logistics business. In our retail business, they work with us on a partnership agreement. They have not used the established process at the moment to come forward and ask for recognition. Um, obviously, that requires them to demonstrate they have enough membership um, and they're therefore representative of our work, representing our workforce. When I met with the GMB, I met with Gary Smith in November of last year, and I asked for that detail, the membership numbers, to demonstrate they were. Um, representing our workforce. I don't have that data. That has never been received. You would be content? You would, you would, you, you would be uh, accepting that approach favourably for, for recognition? Come forward through the process, through the Central Arbitration Committee? Yes, of course. Can I just... Um, uh, I would, uh, yes, go on. Charlotte Nichols. Yep. So you've just said that you would be willing to recognise GMB through the established process with the Central Arbitration Committee, so you wouldn't engage in a voluntary trade union recognition agreement with them, you would go through the statutory CAC process? We would, because we currently already have agreements with other unions in our business, so it's important that we make sure that we're working with the unions that have the representation amongst our workforce. So we currently have collective pay, pay agreements in retail with Usdor. That's 16 that stores in Northern Ireland and the co-op acquisition sites that we already have and of course you know the numbers of individuals with um, the EG business that already are union members so with all that in mind it's important that we can see which unions have the necessary membership to ensure that we give the recognition to the appropriate union. You wouldn't do that on a voluntary basis, you would only do it through the statutory CAC process? We'd do it with the information that demonstrates the required membership, so yes, we would go through the required process. Can I just follow up on that, Chair, because as I understand it, there are the 16 stores in Northern Ireland, but you've got over 600 stores in total in the United Kingdom. 
Is that right? That's right, yes. So that, uh, as a proportion, that is a very, very small minority of the stores where there's trade reunion recognition for retail. We don't have, we can't see the membership in those 600 stores um, here in, the, uh, in the England, uh, Scotland and Wales. Thank you, Mark Pawsey. I know the chairman will have a final question, but I just wanted to ask you, Mr Issa, I've heard, listened to your answers to my colleagues on fuel pricing and employment practices. What impression do you think the financial press, your suppliers and the colleagues within your business will have made of your representation before this committee this afternoon? What I will say is, from my colleagues, we have record sort of um, interaction with the colleagues. We sort of work very actively, respectively. We've done uh, 8 and 10% pay rewards, so from a colleague perspective. Specifically about your performance before the committee this afternoon, Mr Issa, how will the financial press, your suppliers and the workforce within your business uh, think about what, will they, what, what impression will they have gained about the management of ASDA? I think they can only take the actions that we conduct on a daily basis, not this committee. I mean, our suppliers we have an active working relationship with, as we do with our colleagues. Thank you. It was just a clarification question for me. I, I, forgive me if I miss it, but I think, Mr. Issa, you said that you were not planning on using fire and rehire in the current negotiation with ASDA employees. Is that, was that right? Did you say that? Or, Mr. Tatum, do you want it, to come in? What we've said is all options are on the table. We haven't made any decisions, and we are working through a smooth transition um, agreement with our union reps. There's a, it's, 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 we, we don't, sorry, sir, we don't know whether we will end up in a fire and rehire position. No, it is the last resort, it is the last thing that any of us would want to entertain. The numbers I gave you from 2019 demonstrate that we go out of our way to find the route through to protect employment. And I, if no, I may... No, no, um, no, no, no. On, if, if it's in the consultation document at the outset, it cannot be a last resort. You've set, you've set that out as an option right from the off. What do you think that does to industrial relations to put before a trade union, right, if, you, if this doesn't work, we have fire and rehire, as it's, we say it's a last resort. It's there if you don't do our bidding. How is that good industrial relations practice? Having worked with the GMB for the 12 years that I've been with ASTA, um, we've forged a strong um, relationship together. It, we don't always agree, naturally. We don't, we don't agree with all of our union partners from time to time. But we work hard together to, to create job security and to do the right thing for our colleagues. We are joined on that outcome. And looking at what we did in 2019, as you raised it, sir, mm. we did, at the beginning of that um, uh, this consultation in April, we outlined exactly the same process as you're referring to for the middle band pay consultation we're currently in. We did exactly the same. By November, with the GMB, the GMB gave an agreement and a recommendation to their members on what to accept. So we worked hard with the GMB to have a joint agreement, and that is our intention this time as well. Mr Macdonald made the point for me, but we had this issue with British Gas previously, where if you tell your employees that you will fire and rehire them if they don't agree to what you're proposing, even though you say you hope you don't get to that position, it is an obvious threat to employees that they're going to lose their job if they don't do what you're asking of them. That's obvious, isn't it? Well, I mean, so just to be really clear... This smaller group of colleagues that we're in consultation with currently are receiving a premium payment that no other colleagues in our business currently receive. So we have an imbalance and an unfairness on payments in our organisation today. And we want to make sure that we correct that balance. It's a legacy payment. It's, it's not something that they've... The question is not about the legacy payment, Ms Tatum. My question is about the use of fire and rehire. Uh, it doesn't really matter to me what the, the substance of the issue is. You are threatening your staff with fire and rehire, aren't you? We are talking to our staff, our colleagues, about a potential change. What I can refer to, if I may, is we conduct engagement surveys at random th through our organisation. We conducted one in May. Our performance and our engagement has gone up 
across retail stores by 11 points year on year. It is outstripping and ahead of the competitors. That's fine, Ms. Tatum, but my question is whether you're threatening them with fire and rehire. It's a very simple question, and you don't seem to want to answer it. I mean, I've got a copy here of the middle pay band proposal business case from your business, and it says very clearly there that you will serve notice to any remaining colleagues on their existing terms and conditions and offer to re-engage them immediately on the new terms and conditions, those colleagues would not receive any compensatory payment for this action. I mean, this is a threat of fire and rehire that you're putting in front of your workforce. I mean, it's here. You have to say that you are, because it's here. As are the other options on that page. But you are so using fire are and rehire, aren't you, Ms. Tatum? All I want is you to answer my question. You're, using fire, you're threatening fire and rehire, aren't you? Not a threat. It oh, is. It's in the document. Sorry, it's not a threat. Yeah. There are all other options in that document as well, and we are consulting. That's we have had really unacceptable to, to, to say that it's not a threat when the chair has actually shown you the document, it, it, your document, in which you say that that's on the table. Do you not understand that that is just an illogical position for you to adopt? I'm sorry, it is not a threat, and this is not a logical position. I am trying to outline transparently to colleagues different options. We are engaging with those colleagues. We're asking for ideas and suggestions on how we could. We, under, we understand avoid all of that, that Mr. The, the question is really about the threat of fire and hire, but we've only got a few minutes left. Um, Mr. Lavery, you want to come in? I just, just very briefly, I, I wonder, Ms. Tatum, if you could just like Arm mentioned fire and rehire, and you used different words and terminology. What, what, what was it that you used? Dismiss and re-engage. Dismiss and re-engage. Is, is that...? It's, I don't want us to split hairs well, on well, the terminology Well, I, I don't want to split hairs neither, because that simply means fire and rehire. Can I just ask a question? You're obviously a, a bit of an expert in fire and rehire, or dismiss and rehire. Um, because, you know, like, as, as Mr MacDonald already said, that you were part of the Contract 6 consultations, uh, and I, I think you were certainly part of that. You, you've said you were anyway. Um, so you're a bit of an expert in this and, and you understand how, exactly how it works. Can I ask you a really simple question? If somebody re, um, says that they're not prepared to accept what the company are saying uh, and you then decide um, as a last resort even that if people aren't prepared to accept uh, the, the final offers that would they lose their jobs? Not in that place yet. Pardon me, sorry? We are not in that place yet. I'm not We're saying not you are. I'm saying, I'm, I'm, you know, like when you were leading the negotiations the last time, you actually, people lost their jobs. 205 people. 235 people lost their jobs. What a threat that must be, by the way. So what I'm saying is, you, you weren't, we're not at that place now. We weren't at that place weeks before this happened to the 200 node people that lost their job. If people refuse to accept the reduction in pay, because that's what it is, it's a reduction in pay, um, will they lose their jobs? Can I just put you right on one thing? It is not a reduction in pay. Well, so well re regardless, regardless. It's not a reduction yeah, in regardless. Pay. Not I mean, you're taking, 60, you're taking 60 Bring pence. Their contracts... Oh to be com consistent with other contracts Why do you not increase, in why do you not increase the rest of the workforce to the level they are in instead of decreasing? Anyway, will you answer my question, please? If we conclude yeah. our consultation at a collective level and then individual level, everybody has to have individual conversations. This is not a collective agreement. Once we've got through every single individual, those individuals will have, could have the opportunity to consider their future in the business. Okay. If we enter that, so that what, does, what does that actually mean? They've got, yeah, they've well, got well, the opportunity well, of considering yeah. their future in the business. We need to bring what an, uh, what order, order. We need to bring the session to order. I'm afraid we're going round in circles, and may I say the witnesses are probably wasting brief. the committee's time. Mm. Um, can I just finish by asking on fire and rehire? Why are you willing to say dismiss and re-engage, but not fire and rehire? They mean exactly the same thing. As I said, I'm sorry that I'm using different terms. I don't. Yeah, but why? Because I'm using the terms that are the, the professional, the con ACAS the chartered, refers to it as fire and rehire. The Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development call it dismiss and re-engage. Right. I follow their policy in terms of making sure that through our consultation, mm -hmm. because it is an option, not the only option, that we make sure that all right. of those pr processes and policies are followed. I understand. The, just, just for future reference, the dictionary definition of fire says 
to dismiss. And the dictionary definition of hire says to engage. So you can be confident in saying, Ms. Tatum, that ASDA is using fire and rehire tactics, ASDA. Might I say that this has been quite an extraordinary session, not in the way that I hoped it would have been. What we've heard today is that prices are up at ASDA, tax is down, pay is down, money is being taken through a very complicated set of business structures onto offshore companies, and you've not answered any of our questions. I'm just very sorry that we've spent an hour going around in circles and you've not been complying with the questions from this committee. It's not in order, and I think Actually, you've suffered to the detriment for the brand of ASDA to your customers um, and to your suppliers, and I'm just sorry that we're in this position. We have, however, agreed to follow up on a number of issues in correspondence, and we will do so. And if we need to call you again to answer further questions, we reserve the right to do so. Call the session to an end. Order, order. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceed.